on our show today, author Tulika Mehrotra. Tulika, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. The world of films and fashion mm -hmm. come to life under your fluid pen. So before we understand how you got into films and fashion, what is this decision to become a writer all about? You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an overnight thing. This is something that sort of has been, maybe the seed has been germinating for a long time. Um, I was always sort of a weird artistic kid. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so I'd been winning poetry contests as a kid. I was always drawing and painting. I was a journalist in college. Um, and it was just sort of maybe through, um, you know, my career trajectory where I realized, you know, I'm not moving in the direction that I'd like. And writing became a source of venting, an outlet for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point it sort of became a a manuscript, a, a huge one. <laughs> so it was sort of a couple years process. It certainly didn't happen overnight. But the writing interest, that seed has always kind of been there. So do you miss the fashion industry and uh, the world of films? I think you've, you've interacted with both before you decided yeah. to write about them. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I worked in, in the fashion district in Manhattan. So I was literally in the heart of the storm. Uh, over there. And it was great. It was a dream job. But at the same time, I felt it was a bit stifling as mm. well. So uh, for me, with writing, I'm able to sort of um, do and be anything, right? And in, in the role that I was in, in the fashion industry, I was, you know, not necessarily pigeonholed, but I had a role and I had to stay within that. And so that part I don't miss. And the same thing sort of applies for the entertainment industry. When I worked in Los Angeles in that job, I had a very specific job. And um, to be able to move outside of that would have been difficult. But with writing, you know, I mean, I can, I can write as a man, you know, I can write as an animal. Like, there's just infinite freedom. So, no, I don't miss it. I'm grateful for the time that I had. So, Crashing B-Town, it's your new book. Congratulations on its release. Thank you so much. It's very beautifully written. <laughs> Beautiful because you just don't want to put it down. Oh. You know, one of the challenges of, of people who write, mm -hmm. and especially fiction, mixed mm -hmm. with a little bit of personal experience is, mm -hmm. you can meander off into tales and tales and tales. But you're clear, mm -hmm. you're crisp, yet you're lucid, and you keep the reader guessing, saying, I want to read the next sentence. I want to <laughs> read the next sentence. How do you manage that? You know, uh, it's. I would be lying if I said it's not deliberate. I mean, as a writer, you want to maintain attention throughout the narrative. You don't want it to be the worst sin for a writer is to be boring, right? So I, it was deliberate in the sense that I, I didn't want to put a reader to sleep because if you're bored, then I'm bored writing it. So in that sense, it was deliberate. But at the same time, there's an organic nature of the, of the narrative and how it goes. Once my fingers touch the keypad, um, things start happening that I can't outline ahead of time. So um, the editing phase is really where more deliberate action happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is really bad, or this is not too bad, or this is excellent. So um, it, it's, it's kind of thought out ahead of time, but at the same time, it's a sculpture that's being shaped in the process of the writing phase as well. So when you write, and sometimes uh, what you write, you might say, gosh, this is rubbish. But somebody else reading would say, no, no, it's good, keep that. And sometimes you may love what you've written, but somebody else may not appreciate mm, it. Mm. So do you have a sounding board or who's your critic? I am very private about my writing. I don't like to share it until it's truly done. I just feel like it's too fragile in my own mind and it's too fragile in whatever state it's in for me to share it in the middle. Um, and just to give you a little bit of history on, um, on this book, I had written it a few years back, Daily Stopover, the, the book before this one. And um, when I had written it, I was certain it was just the most beautiful thing ever written by any human being mm. ever, you know? And okay. then I put it away for a year and I came back to it and I read it and I was just shocked at how bad it was and how miserably bad it was. I had actually devalued the English language <laughs> with the nonsense that I had written. So it's a very subjective craft. Um, I personally, my process is not to share until I feel comfortable because there's always a little bit of movement. The truth about writing is that it's never done. Writing invariably has a bit of the self reflected in what we're writing, even if it's fiction. Mm -hmm. Does it make you feel vulnerable? Last time, yes. Um, and I was, I was not just vulnerable, I was terrified. I was really scared um, that what will people think? What will people say? And my agent said to me, if that's your problem, then you cannot be a writer. You should not be a writer. Um, even if you have a story to tell, if you're afraid, um, then this is not for you. So the last time around when I really dug into um, 
Leela's story with the fashion industry, I was terrified of what people would think and the reception was so positive. And I had sort of braced myself ahead of time that whatever happens, I'm ready. You mm -hmm. know, I've done the best that I can, I've put it out there and now if, you know, if it gets read, if it doesn't get read, <laughs> I've, I've done my bit. So um, that was really the test. This time around, I've gone even further. And as, as you know, this book is a lot darker and it goes into much deeper subject matter. And so there's a lot more that can be said. But mm -hmm. at this point, because I've already experienced one thing and I realize as a writer, I have to be honest, I have to be truthful. What is the point of writing if there's no integrity behind it? Um, I'm not, I don't feel that vulnerability anymore. Um, while I'm writing it, of course, the, the process is really raw. It's very, at times, painful. There's times when I'm crying as I'm writing um, passages. But at the end, it's just, I feel ready for readers to finally like, be flipping through the pages. So feedback comes in different forms. You mm -hmm. know, critique I can understand. But sometimes there is criticism. Of course. Which is, you might feel it's unwarranted. <laughs> and then you say, okay, I need a thick skin. Mm -hmm. And yet writers are extremely sensitive people. Yeah, I think writers have to be sensitive. We have to be observant um, as to what's going on around us. But at the same time, we go through so many uh, iterations of our writing and our editors beat us down so hard <laughs> that mm. our skin gets really thick. And I think my skin is quite thick. Of course, I would love to please everybody. That's never gonna be the case. And so, I mean, I need to be realistic as well. I can't please everyone and those who enjoy it. I'm grateful those who don't, I love getting their feedback as well. And in fact, I do, I do get their feedback saying, you know, I really enjoy this character, but this one was unrealistic for me mm. and I humbly disagree or maybe I agree or maybe I'll make a note of it that in the future I shouldn't maybe consider this or that so I welcome all criticism at this point my skin is super super thick crashing beatdown yes why crashing beatdown the story as you know is a sequel to Delhi stopover um, and beatdown I've heard in the media I've heard my friends say it's sort of a slang term for Bollywood the Hindi film industry and so instead of using that cliche term I liked B-Town as a reference to, say, Mumbai or the industry or just in general the film industry and Mumbai. So it, it had a couple of meanings for me. I thought it, it felt nice. Also, the storyline is not a um, Leela, the protagonist. She sort of, she's given opportunities and she's sort of crashing into an environment that she's not necessarily aware of. And so the title just felt really natural. For me. And there are layers in the book, you know, mm -hmm. layers about uh, other than being, uh, you know, having shades of, uh, I would say, black and gray, mm -hmm. it's also layered. Uh, it's going to invite a lot of opinion. It's very brutal and honest in mm -hmm. many areas. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting all this down, mm -hmm. I think there is a deep sense of understanding that, yes, you know, the author somewhere has experienced it. And obviously one can't mm. experience everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you talk to people, listen to them, and translate that into an experiential writing? I am very serious when it comes to research. I, you know, I understand the LA film, and film world. I understand Hollywood. But over here, I'm not an actress. I'm not a director. I'm not you know, an assistant director. I'm not a producer. So for me to actually write about this and make sure that the, both worlds that I'm looking at are, are coherent, um, I was on film sets. I spoke to everybody. And of course, there's going to be a level of, um, you know, I, I'll never be able to speak as a producer. I'll never be able to speak as a lecherous casting director. But you can speak to people like that and try to observe things through their eyes and maybe stand in their shoes and look at their motivations. Before I write anything, I always have character sketches. Okay. Uh, so every character has, you know, what do they, what are their motivations? What's their vulnerability? What do they want? What do they, what bothers them? So I try to do that for every character. So if it's the casting director, for example, what exactly does he want? Does he just want, you know, the cliches thing that things that we hear about, or is it more about casting the right person, whatever. So, you know, I do the best that I can, but the, the way that I really operate is I talk and listen as much as possible. It's a sequel, as right. you said, right. and yet they're standalone books. Yes. So when you write or when you think of a plot, you said structure is critical. Yeah. Do new characters keep emerging? And if so, how do you control them? So the first book had a, a very distinct set of characters. Um, and I felt like if I brought those same exact characters into the second one, it would be boring. You know, I mean, I feel like I had already told the story of those characters. The only one that came forward was Leela, who is the protagonist, whose story was unfinished. Okay. So she needed to come forward. But I was very adamant that I didn't want the same characters. So there's literally just her, um, which is also a reason why it can be standalone. In terms of uh, 
of uh, the number of characters. I tend to be a very people-ish writer. I have too many characters sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of this draft, I had to cut out about five or 10 characters that were, you know, they just showed up for a few scenes. They were unnecessary. At the end of the day, it comes down to economy. You know, are they truly needed? If they're not, can their characteristics, can their sensibilities be added to any other environment to another character? Do I really need this person? Because if you look at your own way of, of reading, when you read for pleasure, if there's 12 names within a chapter, you're mm. gonna forget who's who and what did they want. It just becomes too confusing. What's the best compliment you've received for your book? The last book, this one's just come out, so I'm just starting to receive really beautiful messages. But the one that really hit home for me was when an editor at a major magazine um, in India had mailed my editor saying that if I had a teenage daughter, I would force her to read this book. And I, I, I think I was in tears, because it's just that I can't think of a, of a more, you know, a parent mm -hmm. saying that I want my child to read this book. There's no more discriminating audience than that. So for me, that was the, the biggest compliment. Wonderful, because it also shows how deeply you bridged sensibilities of different generations. Yeah. You know? if the mother is inspired and she yeah. knows that the daughter would. And well, she and I wish I could say that was deliberate and I knew what I was doing. That's not the case. I'm just so grateful that it resonated on both, on oh. both audiences. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can understand why. Uh, we're going to go in for a break, Tilika. Mm -hmm. When we come back, we'll find out more about the writing process. Sure. And also, what really makes a writer jump and say, I have something to share? Because writing is also a very private uh, sure. you know, area that all mm -hmm. of us uh, work in. Mm -hmm. All that and a lot more after this break. Stay with us. Pahu, your hands of your powder has removed all the hair. No, ma. Only in 25 rupees. Surf XL Easy Wash, only in 25 rupees. The old one is the same. Where did he go? Let's see. बिना कटे जिलेट गार्ड महंगा होगा नहीं पापा ये दे एक रुपए में एक शेर पीएनजी मुबारक हो फेयर एंड लवली हर दिन अरे तो इतनी खुशी की क्या बात है फेयर एंड लवली जीत गई ना तो हरा कौन फेयर एंड लवली फेयर एंड लवली को हराया न्यू बेस्ट एवर फेयर एंड लवली ने बेस्ट एवर फेयर एंड लवली का नया एडवांस्ड फॉर्मूला जो दे हमारा बेस्ट एवर एक्सपर्ट ट्रीटमेंट तो आपने ट्राई किया फेयर एंड लवली बेस्ट एवर फॉर्मूला सिल्क प्रोटीन एक्सट्रैक्ट और बेहतरीन परफ्यूम्स के साथ लक्स ऐसी महकती कोमल त्वचा कि छुए बिना रहा न जाए रूप तो तेरा मस्ताना प्यार मेरा दीवाना रूप कोई हमसे ना हो जाए रूप तो तेरा मस्ताना कशिश पड़ती ही जाए बस सरस क्या आप अपना डव शैम्पू लौटाएंगी? No chance, कभी नहीं। क्यों लौटाऊं? डव लौटाना मतलब स्मूथनेस लौटाना। नया डव दे 50% ज्यादा पोषण। इसमें है एक चौथाई मॉइस्चराइजिंग मिल्क। ये डैमेज बालों को रिपेयर करे और उन्हें बनाए स्मूथ। नया डव शैम्पू आपके बालों के लिए अनमोल है। मस्ती करने को लड़ाई वाली जोड़ी देखे सपने हम दो चार विश वाली जोड़ी और ये फ्रेशनेस जोड़ी 50 ग्राम क्लोज अप टूथपेस्ट और टूथब्रश का जोड़ी पैक सिर्फ 24 रुपए में ताकि इन जोड़ियों की फ्रेशनेस बरकरार रहे रोन किधर है सर वो नहीं आएगा उसकी मार्चिंग यूनिफॉर्म जो पुरानी है नई शर्ट नहीं पुरानी नया रिन कपड़ों में लौटा है नई जैसी सफेदी और जगह छीनी नहीं जाती बनानी पड़ती क्या आप जानती हैं? Pons White Beauty को अब Gen White से perfect बनाया गया है, जिसकी हर बूंद आपकी त्वचा में गहराई से काम करे। सिर्फ सात दिनों में जिद्दी दाग हटाए, त्वचा की रंगत हल्की बनाए, और आप पाएं spotless निखरी त्वचा सिर्फ सात दिनों में। Pons White Beauty। मम्मी, मैं, मैं तो टॉस करें हेड्स वे या टेल्स अब खुले बालों का भी गिरना मना है सिर्फ एक रुपए में क्लिनिक प्लस शैम्पू में है मिल्क प्रोटीन फॉर्मूला जो बनाए बालों को मजबूत मम्मी खुले बाल क्लिनिक प्लस सिर्फ एक रुपए में खुले बालों का गिरना मना है
Welcome back. We're still in conversation with author Tulika Mehrotra. Tulika, mm. the whole process of writing mm -hmm. is personal. A lot of us write in various different areas, whether it's poetry or little articles. Mm -hmm. But you say, I want to take this jump. It's a book. It's a book in my head and I know people would like to read it. <laughs> How does that happen? My journey was that I was unhappy in my career and I didn't see a very um, interesting future. And so I was, like I said earlier, just venting. Uh, and within a week of putting ideals on paper, I had maybe 15, 20,000 words, which as a writer or you know, anyone who knows what that quantity, it's a lot. At that point, I wondered, is this, what is this? Is this a novella? Is this a short story? It's longer than a short story, but it's not long enough for a book, but I don't know what's happening. So I just kept writing and writing and writing. And that was when I thought I should you know, be awarded the Nobel Prize or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, th but then I put it away and I sort of got distracted with life. Um, when I came back to it was when I sort of um, had a chance to reevaluate and realize, oh my God, I do have a book, but this is not it. You know, this, the germ of the idea is absolutely there, but these words, these sentences are so amateur and so bad that they're hurting my eyes just reading. That was really a great experience to see for myself, to have the distance and come back and see that, wow, this is the worst writing ever written <laughs> and to be able to take the idea and fix it uh, and when I say fix it I don't mean I went there and fixed it I took this draft threw it away and I started fresh but with the same um, same storyline so do you write uh, nine to five or do you just write wherever you are scribble something how organized or disorganized are you <laughs> wow you really hit the nail on the head there I'm pretty disorganized uh, I find that when I'm I'm forced to be uh, too structured and I feel stifled. I feel very suffocated. So I have a order within my disorder uh, that works for me. And there's a method in your madness. <laughs> I can sense it. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a method in my madness. But if anybody had to find something within my madness, they would lose their mind themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, I, I tried to do the nine to five thing, but I, I hate using the term writer's block and I, I'm just not inspired. A lot of writing is just sitting down on your seat and getting in front of your laptop or you know and doing it even if nonsense is coming out so um, I'm not able to do nine to five but I'm able to do a couple hour chunks and in for crashing B town I became very prolific at writing all night so <laughs> from midnight to 6 a.m. became mm -hmm. my my most productive time that's not quite working for my third book where my morning time periods are, are much more productive but um, yeah structure for me is is suffocating so I find my own structure or where I feel like I can breathe and my brain can can think in its own mad way. Okay. Normally women mm -hmm. write from a female perspective. Yeah. You know, and that's quite obvious throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons you chose to kind of dive into this space mm -hmm. was you could write as anything. Right. You said that. Ever thinking of changing gender in terms of your writing? So I have thought about that. I don't think I'm ready yet. What I am considering is writing from an older female's perspective. Okay. That is something that maybe I can stretch to at this point with some level of you know, authenticity. I can sort of see that direction. I, haven't, I, I don't yet feel confident enough to write as a man. It's something that I probably will do, but not quite yet. I recently wrote a short story where I had to write from a child's perspective and my, my mother's a teacher and so I would have to you know bounce ideas off of her. Does a four-year-old think this way? So um, I'm, I'm playing with age right now um, but as yet gender is, is something I'm a little I'm not sure of yet. So in your mind I'm going to make you play with gender. You know they say sure. men are from Mars and women are from <laughs> Venus. We're different and one school says no, we're all the same. We're just conditioned in different manners. Mm -hmm. And you have myriad characters, mm -hmm. male and female, mm -hmm. and you flesh them out very well. You Thank speak you. to so many people. Mm -hmm. You do so much of research. Right. What are some critical male-female areas of division? Well, I mean, if we think about ourselves, I find that women are much more, um, you know, they're more they have more feelings, you know, and they're more open to communicating them. And I think men are, are more about action. They're more about not necessarily suppressing their feelings, but they're not exactly, you know, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then I was thinking I would do this, and then I would mm -hmm. <laughs> It's just not how men are. They're very action-oriented. They have the data. Here's the action. Point A to point B, done. For women, it's, I think, in my opinion, it's not always the case, but um, we, we're a bit more, um, we think a lot more. We meander. Yeah. <laughs> we meander a lot more. 
uh, which is, I think is great because what ends up happening in the meandering is you find really cool solutions that you would never have really thought of to begin with. Where do you draw your inspiration for your storylines? From a lot of different places. So, uh, you know, initially the first book started from people that I knew, you know, like the quote unquote strugglers. Um, you would see them a lot in L.A. Um, and so that was a great um, source of inspiration for, you know, what we go through. The artist trying to become successful is a great uh, parallel of what we're all trying to do in life, right? We're all trying to become something. We're all trying to achieve something. And this is like the perfect true example of I want to make it. So initially my inspiration sort of came from that. But as I as I read the news, as I, you know, s do my research, the inspiration comes from everywhere. You just have to listen and, and keep your eyes open. So um, I just try to do that. I'm, I'm a very talky person and so it takes a lot of effort to just not talk all the time. Quest for success. Mm. It's there in the books. It's there in all our lives. Mm -hmm. What is success for you? I don't think there's a blank black and white answer for that. I would love for as many people as possible to read my books. You know, I would love for these books to go as far as possible. Um, to be able to touch as many readers as I can would be a point that I would consider success. Um, there's a lot of other things. We've already, um, my agent has already received quite a bit of attention for film adaptation. So that could okay. be another, you know, benchmark of, of success if these were to turn into celluloid. And you know, maybe if I write, you know, a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, like if this just continues, I think success just keeps defining, redefining itself. So right now I just want as many people as possible to read the book. So during the course of writing, mm -hmm. what is it about yourself that you discovered which you didn't know you had? I didn't realize I was as disciplined as you have to be to write a whole book. I've always thought of myself as sort of a weird, like I said earlier, an artistic person where I need space to breathe and you, fine, mm -hmm. breathe. but. You also have to sit down and finish the book. <laughs> uh -huh. So I didn't realize the level of discipline I was, I was truly capable of um, that is absolutely required in, in writing. You need it or your writing will never get done. You know, for a lot of people who are on the creative side, mm -hmm. I think discipline tends to become a bad word, but we don't understand that it's a huge facilitator right. for creativity and freedom. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, I 100% agree with you on that. Um, if I'm allowed to just do anything and be anything with no parameters, I will never complete anything. So the discipline aspect is critical. And there's, there's a million times when I wonder, why did I decide to do this profession? Because it's so hard. Why didn't I pick something easier? I mean, it would've, life would've just been so much calmer if I could just sip lemonade all day long and play with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I think discipline really makes you, it matures you as a writer. It forces you to think faster. Uh, deadlines especially, they make me incredibly creative. It's right at the very end when I'm, surviving on coffee and no sleep that <laughs> all the best ideas seem to come mm. out so so yeah discipline is critical so I didn't realize that I had it in me to to do it twice we would want to understand from you a what are you writing next mm -hmm. and in terms of writing the community of writers as a whole are somewhere a little disturbed that people are reading less mm. you know people have different ways of engaging their heads. Mm -hmm. So what are your views on that? We'll talk about that sure. and a little bit more. You stay with us. Papa, ye to Vaseline jelly nahi hai. Acha, to asli kaun si hai? Ye raha asli Vaseline jelly. Sirf asli Vaseline petroleum jelly hai teen guna shuddhata ki mohar ke saath. Didi kitni shy hai na? Wo to hai. Didi apne har boyfriend se aise hi sharmati hai. Ha? Priya Gold CNC, meethe mein namkeen ka twist. Abhi ji, hamari patni ji kehti hai ki mehak se pata chalta hai ki kapde saaf hue ki nahi. Mehak se. Naya wheel, isme hai neebu ki shakti aur hazaron phoolon ki mehak. Ye hai safai aur ye safai ki mehak. Naya wheel, safai wahi jo mehke. Sanju, idhar. Arey yaar mummy, cake dega to full attack. Sanju, cake, daant sar jayenge. Agar aapka toothpaste abhi behtar attack kar raha hota. तो आपको अटैक नहीं करना पड़ता ब्रशिंग के बाद जर्म्स का अटैक फिर से शुरू नतीजा कैविटीज नया पेप्सोडन जोमी चेक घंटों बाद भी दे 130 प्रतिशत जर्म अटैक पावर तो बेटर क्या है नया पेप्सोडन जोमी चेक 130 प्रतिशत जर्म अटैक पावर वेरी लवली वन मिनट बाले लाइक क्लीन अप अब सिर्फ पंद्रह रूपए में फेयर एंड लवली फेस वॉश अब सिर्फ पंद्रह रूपए में क्या आप अपना डव शैम्पू लौटाएंगे नो चांस कभी नहीं क्यूँ लौटाऊ 
डव लौटाना मतलब स्मूथनेस लौटाना नया डव दे पचास परसेंट ज्यादा पोषण इसमें है एक चौथाई मॉइस्चराइजिंग मिल्क ये डैमेज बालों को रिपेयर करे और उन्हें बनाए स्मूथ नया डव शैम्पू आपके बालों के लिए अनमोल है चिकनाई हटाने में कौन है सबसे तेज ये साधारण बार या नया विम बार स्टार नए विम बार में पूरे सौ नींबू की शक्ति है ये और की तरह स्लो मोशन में नहीं धोता वाह चिकनाई हटाए सबसे तेज सौ नींबू की शक्ति वाला नया विम बार मुबारक हो फेर एंड लवली हार गए अरे तो इतनी खुशी की क्या बात है फेर एंड लवली जीत गयी ना तो हरा कौन फेर एंड लवली फेर एंड लवली को हराया न्यू बेस्ट एवर फेर एंड लवली ने बेस्ट एवर फेर एंड लवली का नया एडवांस फॉर्मूला जो दे हमारा बेस्ट एवर एक्सपर्ट ट्रीटमेंट तो आपने ट्राई किया फेर एंड लवली बेस्ट एवर फॉर्मूला अरे खांसी बुखार फिर से गरम कपड़े भी पहना है खांसी जुकाम हाथों पर लगे कीटाणुओं से भी हो सकता है तू एडवांस लाइफ बॉय खांसी जुकाम जैसे 10 इन्फेक्शन वाले कीटाणुओं से बचाता है एडवांस लाइफ बॉय मम्मी मैं मैं तो टॉस करें हेड्स हुई टेल्स अब खुले बालों का भी गिरना मना है सिर्फ एक रुपए में क्लिनिक प्लस शैम्पू में है मिल्क प्रोटीन फॉर्मूला जो बनाए बालों को मजबूत मम्मी खुले बाल क्लिनिक प्लस सिर्फ एक रुपए में खुले बालों का गिरना मना है कितने रंगी नजारे हैं खुश है कि ये बीच इतनी सब चीजें क्यों मम्मी को बोलो सिर्फ ये काफी है नया सर्फ एक्सल बार इसमें है नील ब्लीच नींबू और विनेगर की शक्ति Welcome back on our show today, author Tulika Mehrotra. Tulika writing mm -hmm. is an individual person; it's solitary. Mm -hmm. Yet there is a community of writers. Mm -hmm. So, how do you network with that community? Mm -hmm. How do you enrich each other? Mm -hmm. If you do, and writing as a source for inspiration, or even as a pastime or a way of learning for mm -hmm. people, is somewhere dwindling, and that's a concern. So do you share these two concerns? So starting with the with the beginning part of your question, I think that um writers conferences are incredibly um powerful. I I'm from Chicago, so I've been to a number of writers conferences in the states. It's where amazing writers come together to enrich their own craft, to meet with other writers, and it's an extremely powerful environment where you can actually feel the energy mm -hmm. of other very creative people. um coming together it's an environment where you share ideas where you hone your craft so that is definitely a place where you get an opportunity to meet with others in terms of um while you're writing uh, there are meetups there are book clubs there are um you know poetry readings those definitely exist but i find from my own experience writing is such a solitary thing for me that if i have to start sharing it with someone else it feels like it's being diluted as it's being written it's a very fragile process for me and perhaps i'm just very new in my you know writing experience but for me it's a very private very truly fragile mm -hmm. sort of a sort of a thing and i don't like to share it until i feel really truly ready. Mm. <laughs> so it's it's like the caterpillar and the butterfly. So you wanted to emerge. I wanted to emerge and it can be a deformed butterfly. That's fine. It's okay. fine if it's a totally weird looking butterfly. And then let's edit it. Let's really work on it then. But while it's still in that as you said a caterpillar phase, I don't feel safe. Um not nobody's going to everybody has brilliant ideas. I don't I don't mean it in that way, but I don't feel comfortable releasing it because I may lose the the inspiration. Fair. myself. Absolutely. Um the second part you said are people reading less. I think there's a lot of distraction out there. Definitely. There's technology, video games, movies, but that's been there. What I found so surprising about India is that it's not the case. Uh every bookstore that I've been to um I've been grateful to see that my books are really selling out mm. and uh, the cash registers are ringing. I mean constantly books are being bought and I'm finding that people here are really reading a lot more than a lot of my friends over there. Um granted in the states um you'll see more people with tablets and Kindles so you don't know what they're reading you can't see the cover. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. But they are reading and and what I find so so amazing is that despite having all these amazing opportunities and outlets and ways of um spending our mental bandwidth people are still going back to the escape of reading fiction or non-fiction because it is an escape we have busy lives we have stressful lives our 
you know, our family, friends, work are all pu pulling us in different directions, that there's never any time for ourselves. And so I find that the, the books, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, gives people an opportunity to be by themselves. Um, and so I, you know, I agree that some people will say people are reading less, but I, on the whole, don't think that's the case. You obviously love writing, but what part of being an author <laughs> you don't like? Especially don't like editing when it's not in my hands. Mm. Um, the way that writing works is that you write it, you give it to your editor, they give you feedback, and then it goes back to them and then they edit it. And that's the hardest part for me because then this child that I've created is being given to someone else and they're, you know, <laughs> they're kind of tearing it to pieces and so that still sort of hurts a bit. Writing for me, like I said, a very solitary thing. I'm the boss, I'm the creator of the story, of the novel, of the um, of the characters that control their destiny and then at that point I'm not in control. Okay. And so <laughs> that part is the least comfortable for me but the most necessary of course as well because I don't have the objectivity anymore. So. And what about all the traveling around and promoting your book? You know? That's a blast. That part is a lot you of fun. Them. I love meeting with the readers. I love interacting with them online, on Facebook, Twitter, um, meeting them in person. When I was here last year, the first time I saw somebody not only pick up my book in a bookstore, I was there signing, nobody knew I was there, I was sort of off on the side, mm -hmm. <laughs> signing the books, and she took it to the register to pay for it, and I felt like I was having like some kind of out-of-body experience, mm. <laughs> that I actually approached her like a big nerd and said, can I please have a picture with you, and I think she thought I was crazy, but um, I love that part. I love interacting with the readers, I love being in, in a, I love having that FaceTime, it, it mm -hmm. really makes my day. So what if you had to come to India and write mm -hmm. a book? And That'd be great. That mm -hmm. would be great. I mean, I speak fluent Hindi, which is becoming less and less important, but it's it helps. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily want to be in a very uh, busy environment like this. I might want to go to a hill station. I think that would be great for writing. It would be great for creativity and inspiration to be in, in an environment like India. Right. So tell me this bit about an Indian sensibility in writing. Is it mm -hmm. a myth or is there something like that? Uh, I think there's individual sensibilities. I don't necessarily know if it can be, um, you know, race specific. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in India, but I was raised in, in the US. And so, or I grew up in the US. Um, but I've never completely felt completely American or completely Indian. I've always felt very much both. Um, so when I write, as you know, the Leela is the main character, she's a NRI, so I'm able to speak from her perspective. Okay. But I'm here, and the other characters that are speaking and talking and interacting with her, they're Indian, right? So I need to speak from their, from their perspective as well. So in terms of the sensibility, I guess I'm, not, I'm, I'm never completely able to understand what that means. Like if you look at um, an author like Jhumpa, Jhumpa mm -hmm. Lahiri, um, she's known as writing sort of that nostalgic Indian fiction, the immigrant experience. Um, and I don't think she sees it. I mean, maybe she sees it as just pure writing, you know, as opposed to like that specific boxed in genre. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that every writer is unique. I don't think that there's a, a bucket that they fall into, that they happen to be French and so they're writing from a French sensibility. People write from the experiences that they have. If they happen to have grown up in France, they're okay. gonna get that. But okay. they may have had a broken family that was exactly the same as somebody in Alabama, you know? So it's, uh, it's, I think it's too, it's not structured enough to say necessarily, I think. Do you think it's an advantage to have, uh, having been born here and brought up in the West, so good exposure to the East and the West, you manage to get objectivity about both sides? I think it's a very deliberate thing that you have to sort of step out of yourself and, and look at yourself, like what are my motivations, what are, whatever. What I do have is a really supportive family. My parents are really supportive. They not only, you know, obviously we have a, a, a strong family support here in India. We're based in the States, but I've also lived and traveled all over Europe. I studied, I got my master's in Italy. I studied French in, in Paris for a while, and I did um, an undergraduate business school uh, exchange in the UK. So I have the whole world I feel like at my at my fingertips mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've physically been there so when you travel at a very sort of impressionable young age Just you're so yeah, yeah you absorb so much and you and you realize that we're all so insignificant we're all so in and in not in a bad way truly in a there's so much humbling way yes yeah. yes in a very humbling way in a very humbling way you realize what you do matters but it's not that it's not that bad so the objectivity comes with, I think, 
having exposure at an early age and realizing <laughs> you're not all that. Writing also makes you more philosophical. It might. In, in my experience, I just need to stop being me, you know? Like I need to remove myself and try to become these 20 whatever other characters that, that I've created. So there's going to be a level of philosophy that comes into that, w deliberately or not. So in terms of readership acceptance, mm -hmm. are uh, people of Indian origin, they're writing across yeah. the world. How uh, easy is it to be accepted, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. being, saying an Indian writer writing for the Western world? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a distinction. I mean, look at the writers that are already out there. There's Salman Rushdie, there's Jumpa, there's a number of writers that have done phenomenally well already. Yes. So there's no, there's not necessarily a, you know, this person happens to be of this origin or, or they so don't. stereotyping is not. I, you know, so. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. If you write quality fiction or nonfiction, you're going to rise to the top and you're going to get attention. And I think that's really at the end of the day what, what matters. I don't think, um, I don't think the origin that where you come from matters as much, truly. Writing is also a process of self-growth, mm -hmm. self-reflection. Right. Know? It's, it's catharsis very mm -hmm. often. How do we encourage people to continue writing, this habit of writing? So more than writing, I, I would go even further and say read. You know, reading and writing are, are so inter, inter, like they're just so connected mm. to each other that if you don't read, you should not be a writer. If you write, you must be a reader. Um, so in terms of, of people maybe not writing as much, it's probably because they're not reading as much. And those who are reading, they usually are inspired that, hey, you know what, this was a great story, but you know, my mom's, dad's, uncle, this something happened to them and I would love to explore that. And I think it really, it, it really plants those, those seeds. So in terms of, of people writing more and encouraging them, they must be reading as well. Um, and, and one thing that it, anybody, and I, I receive messages all the time that I want to be a writer, what should I read? You should read everything that you can get your hands on. You should read as much. It's stuff that you don't like, mm -hmm. stuff that you love, short fiction, long fiction. You should read fiction also. A lot of people are really interested in nonfiction only. So um, I think a way of encouraging people to really keep writing is to read. Wonderful. And I think... Uh, one way to encourage people to read is also for you to keep writing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for deciding to opt out of a traditional career and move into <laughs> writing. Looking forward to some great writing and wishing you all the best for oh, everything so else much. that you decide to write. Thank you. It was wonderful being here.